So one of the things is, is approached by Nachmanides that we can't possibly fathom what really happened before, at the beginning, what really was going on right at the beginning. We can have some information about what happened at the beginning of creation, but we can't fully fathom to its fullest extent of how the, the beginning creation, the initial creation really happened. Okay? But we do know certain things. For instance, that the very beginning, Nachman, we were talking about this on Shabbat, Nachmanides says uh, that the very, very beginning was a very small speck, and in that speck, it had everything in it. That's why the very first creation, it doesn't say God said. It just said in the beginning, God created. But it doesn't actually say that he said something because you only say things to things that already exist. You don't say things to things that don't exist, right? If, if no one's in the room, why on earth would I be speaking? Unless I'm crazy, right? So God doesn't need to speak if nothing's around, he just needs to allow it to exist. So speaking refers to things that are already in existence. And we understand, according to Judaism, that the very first beginning was something that came from nothing. But at the end of the day, we can't fully know what was in that something. Because it was tohu vavohu. This is what Nachmanides explains. It was basically emptiness, it was confusion, it was absolutely... Something that cannot be described in any way. But it was something. Okay? So this is what Nachmanides says about the beginning. The very, very first beginning. Everything was in it. All of reality was in it. And from there, everything else came to be. But the very first initial beginning was Bereshit. And that beginning has something that we cannot describe. And he actually says that all of this isn't really for what we need. We don't need to really learn... All about creation. Because, it, because it's beyond us, it's not even fathomable to us. There is no real need for us to really learn about creation. That's what he says. Why is it not? For, why is it not? Because it's, it's so short. that What is the Torah in Hebrew? What does Torah mean? Tanakh. Yes, Tanakh is Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. Tanakh is a combination of three different books. There's the Torah, the five books of the Moses... There's Nevi'im, the prophets, and Ketuvim are the writings, the books of writings. But Torah itself has a definition. Hora. Hora, teaching. It's meant to teach me how to live in this world. It's a Torah Chaim. As well as the fact that it's godly, but the main message of Judaism is to teach me how to, or at least to guide me on how to live in this world. Because this world is pretty confusing, right? If you put a kid into a room with thousands of books. He's going to have to go through each book. Thousands of different books. He's going to try this one and that one and this one and that one to try and learn something. But he may spend his whole lifetime picking the wrong books unless he has the direction of which book to pick first, which book to pick second, which book to pick third and fourth. We go through life, many people, and they pick and pick and pick and pick. They pick this lifestyle, this lifestyle, until eventually they're completely... Uh, wasted. They've spent their whole lifetime trying this and this and this and this and this. Well, life is too short to try this, this, this and the other. You've got to have direction in this world. And that's why Torah is something which is Horat Chaim. Okay, makes sense? So that's why we have Torah. And he says, Nachmanadi says, for that reason, we don't really need it. Rashi also says this point. We don't really need to start from the beginning with the story of creation. We don't really need that. Okay? But there are powerful messages, even though it's way beyond us, there are powerful messages that we can learn from this idea. Okay? So I want to go back to what was discussed last week with Rabbi Jacobs. And we're going to talk about the Adam and Eve eating from the apple. What does that really mean? We spoke about it last week, so I'm just going to touch on that. But I want to talk about the challenges that we face. Because if that story was the very first story... So then it's a story, it's a challenge that we all go through. It's not there for no reason, it's not written for no reason. It's there to teach me that we all, as a people, go through these basic, basic fundamental challenges in our lives as well. Okay? So I want to take you through some of those challenges that they went through and see, and talk it out with you, and see how we go through those challenges as well. Okay? So... 
last week we said that it was the tree of knowledge, right? The tree that he ate from was there was two trees. There was one called Etz Hachaim, and there was one called Etz Hadat, the tree of knowledge. What does it mean you get knowledge when you eat from the tree? Knowledge of good and evil. Exactly. So you get connected to good <laughs> and evil. And we spoke at how when you are, Rabbi Jacobs spoke about how today we do things and we messed, we mixed up because we have this knowledge. Okay, Knowledge doesn't just mean that I know. It means that I'm actually emotionally connected to the idea as well. Okay, So he explained that we have times in our lives where we do things which are completely wrong in our minds, but in our emotions, because we feel like we want it, it's completely okay, right? So you'll know, you'll have somebody who's smoking a cigarette, and he knows in his mind that smoking is completely crazy, it's bad for me, everyone tells you smoking is bad for you, and you're still smoking? So why are you doing it? The answer is, because we're disconnected from our minds to how we feel in our emotions. Our mind says, this is not good for me, but our emotion says this feels great right now. So I'll go for the emotion, I'll go for how I feel over what my intellect tells me, which is it's good for me. The only way to really overcome my emotions is to get to understand fully the dangers and to feel the dangers of a smoker. And Rabbi Jacobs explained that if you go to a, if you go to a uh, uh, hospital and you spend a whole day there watching people almost dying, gasping because of the smoking that they did their whole lifetime, and you leave that building, and then you say, oh, I want to light a cigarette right now, right? What would happen? Would it be easy to smoke or harder to smoke? Harder. harder. Much harder, because now you really feel, you don't just know that smoking is bad for you, you feel how bad it is for you as well, okay? Well, that's what it was like before Adam ate from the tree. He knew his mind was completely in tune with how he felt. If it's bad for me, I don't want it. Period. I don't even desire it. I don't want it. It's clear as day that I don't want it. But today, we are messed up. Yeah, let me explain to you what I mean, okay? Because Rabbi Jacob spoke about this, but I felt like there's some extra points that I need to put in. Today, there's people that spoke, told me that there's such a thing that, that there's many times when people tell me there's no such thing as absolute truth. Has anyone heard that before? Right? There's no such thing as absolute truth. Have you ever heard this before? There's no such thing as saying, I know what's true. Maybe it's true for me, but it's not true for you. And maybe it's true for you, and it's not true for me. And maybe it's true for you, but it's not. Who am I to say that this is right and this is wrong? Okay, that's a, fa- that's a good, good question. Right? It's a good question. Yeah. So there's many approaches to that to answer that question, but I want to approach it based on what we just said. If I know that there's something wrong for me, forget it. Forget about whether there's absolute truth. Even within yourself, there's no, we, are, we, we have absolute truths that we go against ourselves. If I myself, forget about the people and the people around me, even me myself, I know that I should not be eating this cake after I've eaten so much of it, and yet I still eat it, I know that I shouldn't be smoking and I still smoke. And I have absolute intellectual knowledge and clarity that this is wrong for me to smoke. And yes, people still smoke. Then within each person, right, you can't say that there's absolute truth, right? Even within each person, you have to ask yourself, wait a second, how can you in yourself, within yourself, say that you have so to speak, your own truth. You don't even have your own truth within yourself. Which tells me that even within us, there is no such thing as absolute truth. When people come to me and say, hey, there's no such thing as absolute truth, I tell them, well, even within yourself, there's no such thing as absolute truth. And then they get confused, right? Because within me, there should be some kind of absolute truths, whatever I feel. But the truth is that there's time, does everyone follow me? Because this is like, Right? The truth is that there's times where I think something in my mind and I know it's wrong for me and I still do it. Mm-hmm. Why are you still doing that? 
If you know it's wrong, why are you still doing that? Yeah, what were you going to say? Complicated people. Because we're confused people, well, right? So this is all... I mean, we can't... Uh, like, yeah, you can, you can say smoking a cigarette is bad for people. You can say doing a lot of things is, is bad for people. But it's still uh, a choice made on choosing risk versus reward in a lot of cases. Choosing Is risk, smoking like bad? Us, it is, but someone choosing to smoke... Uh, yeah. Like or anything. Talk about matter. cigarettes. Any, 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 <laughs> any habit that somebody has, they're they're still making a decision based on a whole bunch of variables. Okay. And it's like, yeah, absolute truth is a formula. It's not a like if if you were to look at it that way, it's it's formulaic. That's true. And, and I'm just trying to show you that in your intellect, you may say that this is bad for many. You ask, if you ask that smoker, is it bad for you to smoke? They'll say, yeah, it is. Yeah. But he's still doing it. So even within himself, he'll agree that there's, I don't, fit, I don't even follow my own absolute truth. That's what, he's, even each person can say, I don't always follow my own absolute truth. Because I say something which I intellectually know is true, and yet I do something else, even within us. So that being said, we all need a direction. We all need a direction, meaning we need to remember that we fail as human beings ourselves and we need direction to guide us into making sure that we do the right thing. That's what Torah is. So it's a guidance to fixing, by the way, Etz Chaim was the tree that he should have eaten from. And instead of that tree, we were given Torah Chaim, right? The Torah is also called an Etz Chaim. Etz Chaim Hila Machazikimba. It's a tree of life for those that hold on to it. Interesting. The Torah is the Etz Chaim that we're meant to cling on to instead of the tree of life that we could have eaten from instead of the tree of knowledge. Does this all, any of this make sense to anybody? Yeah. Okay. So, so yes. Also, you forgot to mention that like, yes, some people do bad stuff like smoke and cigarettes and stuff, but like there's also the opposite. Like some people know that going to the gym and working out is, is good, but they don't do it. So like, right. it's also the opposite of like, doing stuff that you should be doing, but you don't do them. Yes, there's also people that know intellectually I should be doing. Yeah. And before Adam ate from the tree of knowledge, between good and bad, meaning that knowledge means that you, that you have bad in you now, and you're confused, you feel that bad is also good as much as bad, good is bad. You, feel, you get completely confused. You know that there's people who are confused between what's good and what's bad. And you look at them and you're like, what are you doing? This is bad for you. And he's confused. He says, I know it's bad for me, but for me right now, this is good. For me right now, it's good for me to smoke. What, what, what do you mean? It's, we all know this is bad. No, but for me, it's, that's called the Etz Hadav Tov that's, that's what it means, that I have the knowledge between good and bad. Not that I know good and bad. It says, Adam When Adam was with his wife for the first time, it said, Adam knew his wife. And what does that mean? They had a relationship, right? But it doesn't mean that he knew her. When it says, I know, it means that he had an actual connection, not just in the mind, but also an emotional connection to the person as well. Okay, so that's what it means when it says, Adam yada et chavayt ishto. You clearly see that when it says the word to know, it also means to be connected to. And what happened was, when he ate from the tree, he was now connected to good and evil. He was confused between what's good and what's bad. And sometimes people in our lives think that bad is good. And we see it all the time. And they think that good is bad. That's the confusion. That's the messed up confusion that we all as a humanity have today, based off the story of Adam. Yes? Was it good or bad for him to know his wife? Though? Sorry? Are they saying it was good for him to know his wife? It was very good for him to know his wife. That was he was in, and it was done in a. Only afterwards did he realize he was naked. What does that mean? He realized that his physicality, he realized that his physical being could be used for the wrong way. He realized that now that he was in a world where he saw good in a way that he can also use it for bad, and he saw bad that he can use for good, right? So at this moment, he realized. That he could be in a relationship with someone and that sexuality could be used in a, in a very, very immodest and objectifying, exploiting way. It could be used in a very bad way. So that was, sorry? Or a good way. Or a good way. Before that, he only knew it as a clean and good. It's like somebody who's, right, an example would be, um, you know, 
you have a, a person that's riding a horse, okay? So they're riding on the horse and they're wearing... The person that's riding the horse is, is wearing clothes, right? Uh, and he's riding on the horse and he's, the, the horse is galloping and he's going and, he's, and you ask him, uh, you know, you're on the horse, but the horse is naked. So he says, but that's, that's fine. That's just, that's how horses are. Like, that's what they are. They, they are naked. But how are you on this horse? I mean, it's true. Because the horse is used to move me and it's used to, in a way which is important for me, but it's not, that's not me, right? It's, it's not me. If you say to the person, hey, what are you doing naked? He say, he'll say, I'm not naked. I'm wearing my clothes. My horse is naked, right? That's not me. So after, after the person ate from the tree of good and bad, he now identified with his physicality as a primary part of who he is. Okay? The physical part of me is now on a much more primary surface level, which is what I see as the number one factor at the beginning. Okay? So when he ate from the tree of knowledge, he saw that physicality could be used in an objectifying way, even if I don't know this person, even if I'm not connected to this person, I can use it in a bad... By the way, it's one of the holiest things ever. It's called the yasod, the foundation, right? The, the, the idea of sexuality is the foundation. That's what builds the world. But if, if it's used in a very objectifying way, that was the minute he realized, oh my, I'm, oh my gosh, right, literally, uh, I'm naked. Right? And he covered himself because he realized that this force has such a power to either build worlds or destroy worlds. And it really does. Okay? So that was really... Uh, the, I don't want to get too into... I already did get too into the story of how he ate from the tree. Uh, I, I mean, I didn't want to talk about what Rabbi Jacob spoke about last week. I hope that everyone got it. But I just want to touch on a few things. Okay? I want to touch on how the evil inclination works. So here goes the big question. I wrote a list of things which shows me how our inner evil works. Okay, so we can learn who was the evil inclination at the time that Adam ate from the tree? The snake. The snake, right? <clears throat> so what did the snake tell the woman? How did he convince her? And if we talk about the language he used and the techniques he used, we can also learn about our own in our own personal yetzahara, our own inclination, which pushes us to do wrong things, even though we know that we shouldn't be doing wrong things. There's times when we know we should not be doing this, and yet we still do it. Okay, so what is that force that pushes us? And I'm going to talk to you the language of the snake, and we're going to see different ways, different ways or techniques that the yetzahara, the evil inclination works, to push us to do things that we don't necessarily want to, even though we know it's wrong for us. Okay, so... It says like this, okay, I'm going to read the words, translate it, you tell me what you think was the very first initial uh, mistake, okay? So the snake actually doesn't go to Adam first, he goes to? Eve. He goes to Eve first, okay? And he says to her, hey, I just want to talk to you. I just want to know, did God say you can't eat from all of the garden of the tree? All the trees of the garden. The, what's, going, what's going on with the trees of the garden? Right? And Rashi says like this. Listen to this. Uh, he says to her. I don't see that Rashi here. But he says to her. Af. What does Af mean? Even. He was just talking about it to them. He was testing the waters to them. Right? So he was telling her, listen, I want to know, in general, how, what's going on with the trees in the garden? What's going on with all those trees? And that's exactly how the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, works. Okay? It tells us, I uh, can't see, oh, here. He, he saw them eating, but he still asked them about that topic in order to bring them to speak about the tree. So he sees that they're eating from the trees, but he's like, hey, did, what's, what's with the trees of the Garden of Eden? Right? 
And that's the very initial way, the first way that our own evil inclination works. What does it do? Do you know what it does? Ask the question. It just brings up the topic. Mm. It says, no, I'm not going to do anything wrong. I just want to talk about it. Right? Or I just want to, I just want to hang out there. Mm. Or I just want to, I'm not going to do anything wrong. My very first initial drive is just hang out in that place, okay? Or let's talk about the cake. Or let's talk about whatever it is, right? So the Lashon Do you know what, how, how does Lashon work? The Chafetz Chaim says one of the first ways of speaking gossip, it goes like this. You, you go up to the person that you are friends with and there's someone you don't like, right? There's Dave that you don't like so much. So what do you do? You talk to the person, you know, and you're like, you know, I've, and you, we all know that you don't like Dave. The other guy also doesn't like Dave so much. And you bring up the topic. So you say, you know, I've seen Dave recently. I've seen him. I saw him two days ago. I saw him last week. Oh, and then comes, oh, he's such a jerk, right? And then you're like, good, that's it. I'm in, right? So it starts off with just talking in general about the person as a whole. And then eventually comes in the real challenge, okay? So that's the very first initial test is Oh, let's just talk. I just want to talk to you about all the trees. Is it that God said all the trees? Okay, so that's the very first one. It's that it tests the waters. It wants to just talk about the topic, okay? The second test is, and this is very common, it focuses on the negative. Look at the next case. Can you tell me what she says? So the woman says to her, no, of course we can eat from the trees. There's nothing wrong with that. Right? And we can eat from the trees of the garden. There's nothing wrong with that. But we can't just eat and we can't touch that tree. Okay? So what did she do? Sorry, she says, and from the trees of the garden, God says you shouldn't eat from and you shouldn't touch it because you will die. The tree of the garden. From that tree of the garden, he jumps straight into this specific tree and he says, that tree of the garden, God says don't eat from and don't touch it. Okay? So if, if you want to know what the second stage is of Chava's mistake, of Eve's, Eve's mistake was this point here. She says, oh, you know, he comes along and he says, hey, I just want to talk to you about the trees. So she says, he says, can I touch, can I eat from, can I eat from the trees? So she says, no, you can't eat from this tree. What did she focus on? What she can't have instead of what she does have. Exactly. What she can't have instead of what she can't have. And do you know what the Midrash says? The Midrash says that there were thousands and thousands and thousands of trees, more trees than we have today in our time. Okay? There were thousands of types of fruit trees, and she focused on the one tree that she can't have. And that's how we fall in the trap of the evil inclination. What does it tell you? Evil inclination tells you, this is bad for me. You know why I'm doing it? I'll tell you why I'm smoking this week. I'll tell you why I'm drinking tonight. Why are you drinking? Because, because, no, 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 that's okay. That's like a little drink, that's fine. That's, that's called uh, sentiment, uh, sacramental, right? What's it called? It's a social it's a drink. drink. No, a religious drink. What's it called? Like a social drink, fine. Yes. But when you get to a point where you say, wait a second, my life is really bad right now, and you find yourself an excuse to drink, then you're looking at it and you're saying, wait a second, I have this which is good for me, I have this which is good for me, this is good for me, this is good for my life, hey, right, everything's great, but this is wrong. What's, what, right, what, what happens? You focus on the negative. That's how a person comes to fail in many, many areas. Do you know how you fail in many areas? You say, oh, this part of my life is bad, okay? This tree I can't eat from. What are you talking about? You have thousands of trees that you can eat from. And the quality, the second thing here is that she had was she focused on the negative as opposed to focusing on the positive. She didn't say, God said, I can eat from all the trees besides for this one. She said, this tree I can't eat from. Don't do that. Because in life, 
you are going to face situations every day where things are good and things are not good. And you must focus on the things that are working for you. How do people say, why? So you ask people, so why are you not involved with Judaism? So they tell you, because I just don't, I don't like Shabbat, right? Well, there's many things that we do like, you know, there's some great things about Judaism. Can we talk about those, right? We can talk about community. It's, there's many, many good things that Judaism has too. But it's when somebody focuses on the one thing that you don't like, right? That's it. I don't like Judaism. Judaism's out for me. I don't like this thing about Judaism. I don't like the fact that Shabbat has this, right? I don't like Shabbat in this area. Or I don't like this part. Wait a second. There's many parts of, there's many people that come up to me and they say, listen, I want to be involved with Judaism, but I don't like that it does this. So I say to them, why are you only focusing on that? There's many other areas that are great, so work on those. And maybe eventually one day you'll work on this area too, but why are you focusing on what doesn't work for you? And that's a common mistake that we have. It's a very com- it says, genuvim yimtaku. Stolen waters are always sweeter. Something which is not yours, mm-hmm. or which you can't have, or a child is told, oh, you can't have this? That's the thing that he's going to want. Okay, so the second stage of the Yetzara is focus on what's wrong as opposed to focusing on what's right. Focus on what's not going well for you as opposed to focusing on what's all great for you, how much things you can do. You're focusing on the one thing you can't do. Okay, so that's the second part of the Yetzara. What's the next thing? She said, you can't touch it. Did God say you can't touch it? Did anyone say you can't touch the tree? No. You can't eat it. Just not eat it. But she said you can't even touch it. And what does that tell me? Rashi says, Hosifa al She added more than she was meant to do. She added words. And because of that, Bali Degiron, she failed because of that. She fell because of that one point. Why? Because she added more than what she was already meant to do. And here goes a very powerful lesson. Even though we have certain boundaries in Judaism, we do have boundaries that we make, right? In Judaism. But at the end of the day, it says in in Mishlei that we should not add more than what we are already given. Never add more than what you're given. Okay? Yes, we have certain laws that are there to make boundaries to stop us from failing. But we also have a rule. There's enough what the Torah forbids on you. Don't go and add more. And this is how the Yetzirah works. What's the Yetzirah work? The Ibn Kanation, it tells you, oh, Judaism is so hard. Right? It's so difficult. It doesn't allow me to work on Shabbat. It doesn't allow me, it doesn't even let you walk on Shabbat. What? Judaism lets you walk. Right? But the person that the person that's the person that gets you know the person that gets frustrated or doesn't want it, he will add a few more points to s- emphasize why he doesn't want it. Okay? So that is another way or another technique of the Yitzhara of the evil inclination. It finds another reason and it adds another reason to push you away from wanting it in the first place. Does that make sense? Okay? So if let's say you're having a conversation with somebody and uh, you're talking with them and it's just, you're having this conversation and you want to pound on someone. You want to just take somebody down. You want to talk about how bad they are, blah, 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 right? You want to just talk about how bad this person is and how ridiculous they are and how stupid they are and so on. What are you going to do? Complain. You'll complain. You'll talk about the negative of the person. You'll start off just talking about them in general. Then comes the negative of them and then comes the exaggerated point that the person didn't even do, okay? Not only is he a jerk, right? <laughs> right, the head move. But he's not only is he a jerk, he also stole, he did steal, right? Or he is anti this, that, and the other, and this. He hates, he hates all these types of people. No, he didn't, he didn't say that. He didn't say that, right? He just said one thing, and what you did was you went and added another five things to, so to speak, legitimize the conversation that you're having. Okay, so that's the third uh, thing. It makes it seem 
much greater, much grander than what it really is, and therefore legitimizes you for going and doing it. It's impossible anyway. Judaism is impossible anyway. It makes you not do this, 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 and then you added another thing. Why did you add that? Right? Somebody told me, does, Ju- does Judaism allow you to take medicine? So I said, why not? So they said, because you have to be natural, and you know, you've got to enjoy the physical, you've got to enjoy the world, and you've got to live in a natural way. This is the way God made you. So you see, many times people, without the knowledge of what the Torah wants from me, they add, right? They will add certain things that they think makes Judaism impossible to be. Judaism is not impossible. And that's why we have a commandment in the Torah. There's a statement in the Torah which tells us that it's, it's, it's something which is It's not something which is impossible for you to do. It's not over the heavens and it's not over the seas. It's here. It's right here and it's possible for us to do it. It's not some It's ways are pleasant. It's not trying to make you live a very difficult life. But it's the, it's the statement that, oh, it adds on to me an extra law, which no, no one said it adds on that law. And we do that when it comes to many other things, right? Uh, if somebody wants to eat a cake, they'll say, you know, you need to have every once in a while an extra, you need to let your brain have those extra sugars. You need to have, you need to relax once in a while, right? We'll talk about how good it is then you'll hear the one person coming along and he'll say, not only do you need to have it, but it's good for you to eat the cake. Right? It's good. And he'll add you another point. Right? So, what, what I'm trying to say is that the way that the evil inclination works is it adds in another idea to emphasize the direction that you want to go in. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay? Everyone with me? Okay. Here's the next one. So the snake says to the woman, No, don't worry. It's not going to be, nothing bad is going to happen. You're not going to die if you eat from the tree. Right? This is the snake's next statement. Don't worry, nothing bad is going to happen. What does that do? What, what do we do? How do we in ourselves do that ourselves? What, what kind of, right? What do we do? This is the next stage. The same thing. Start your diet tomorrow. Yeah, it's, 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 what is, it's not, it's fine, I'll start my diet tomorrow, you won't die, it won't hurt you, it won't hurt you, it won't hurt you, it won't hurt you, until it hurts you, right? And how many times, how easy, it, it, it takes one time to fall off a roof to be hurt, right? And that's it. So you've got to make sure that you're careful, right? It takes one time for a kid to fall in the pool, to, for the kid to be lost, right? So you've got to make the boundaries right from the beginning and not do it. Don't say, oh, it's not going to... So what we do as well is we say to ourselves, ah, it's not going to kill you. It's fine. It's not that bad. And what we need to remember is it is that bad. Okay? It is severe because if you do one thing, it leads to another. It leads to another. It leads to another. And eventually you fall in a terrible pit. Okay? So it's the ones that say it's not that bad that really uh, fall. Okay? Let's see the next one. Now goes the snake and he says, listen, if you eat from it, you're going to be more like God. Because the day that you eat from it, your eyes are going to be opened and you're going to be like God. You'll know between good and bad. Okay, so what was that? What was that? What was that statement? What was the Yitzhara, the evil inclination saying? Seducing you. Right, it was seducing you, but there's... He already said it. Oh, it's not that bad. We've had a love. What type of seducing is this? Uh, it says, you're going to be even better. You're going to be like God. It doesn't just say, hey, you're not going to die anymore. It says, you're going to be like God. And you're, you're, from the day you eat it, you're going to even get better. Your eyes are going to open. You're going to be like God. You're going to know between good and bad. What's that stage? Lying. Right. Not only lying, no, exactly. right? Showing the good in the bad. Exactly. Showing the good in the bad. Now it's doing a whole new level. Right? It's showing that, hey, if you do it, not only are you going to be fine, but you're actually going to be like God. You're going to be better off. And how often does that happen to us? That's the next stage. When we actually do something that we shouldn't be doing, and we actually say to ourselves, not only you should be doing this, but it's actually good for you. 
Okay? The stage before I was saying is that you, you, you seems, right, you make it seem much harder than you say, oh, I'm not going to die, right, it's not that bad. And then the next stage is, it's actually good for you. And in fact, actually we understand that this initial stage was good for him. It was good because Adam didn't have any evil inclination in him. He only had a good inclination in him. It was only from the outside, the snake was outside of him, it was before he ate from the tree, and he had absolute clarity of what was good and what was wrong, right? His feelings were completely in tune with the way he was thinking. So when he, before he actually ate from the tree, what did he say? Oh, you're there, Elohim. God, right? You will be better. It's going to be good for you. You'll open your eyes. It rationalizes. And let me tell you something. I've, sp- I've mentioned this last week. The greatest destruction of mankind came when people legitimized their actions. They said, I'm doing it with the right intentions. Throughout history, the worst of things have ever happened with the right intentions. Right? You've got Hitler. Look at just this past century. Hitler, Stalin. What was their intention? Make the world pure. Right, make the world better. they, they, They all came with a statement that we are doing something good for the world. And was it really good for the world? No. In their eyes, it was good for the world. Don't you think it was good for the world? No. But in their eyes, it was a good time. You, you have to understand that, that the greatest of evils are done with the good intentions. Why is it done with a good intention? Do you know why? Because the Yetzirah. Right, the Yetzirah eventually convinces you that it's good. But why does it convince you that it's good? Why is it better? Why can't the person admit that I'm doing something wrong? Pride. Pride, what else? Otherwise, why would you do it? You see, if I know it's wrong and I still do it, if I know it's wrong and I still do it, at a certain point, I'm going to break. I'm not going to do the greatest of evil. Because there's, a, <clears throat> there's that disconnect between the intellect and the... Flesh. Yeah. When I do evil and I, <coughs> and I actually know, when I do evil and I know it's wrong, so there's a disconnect. My mind says, this is completely wrong, right? Let's say... You have a group of people that are living, uh, working for ISIS, right? And they're doing whatever they're doing, killing people somewhere in Syria. And they're shooting ISIS, right? Doing their thing. And at a certain point, one of them decides, wow, this is crazy. I am wrong. I shouldn't be doing this. Okay? And he still lives there. And he's still doing the stuff. But he knows that he's wrong. He's still doing it because he's pushed into it. But in his mind, he knows he's completely wrong for doing it. I want to tell you that that person will be limited in his ability to do evil. Because at the end of the day, his evil has a capping limit. Because at the end of the day, his mind says, this is wrong for me. But the greatest of evils are done when you actually think, this is right for me, this is good, and you act on it as well. That's when the greatest... Because evil can never be taken to a very large scale unless you really think that it's good to do evil on a large scale. Does that make sense? If you think, if you never think it's good, but you still do it, so then you're only doing it because you feel you're pushed that way, but eventually you're going to stop. Yes. So when you say that we actually believed he was doing a good thing for the world? Yes, he did. And he he gave a great speech, right? The great speech that he gave in 1944 uh, in front of thousands of people. And he convinced everybody that this is the right thing to do. And he wrote a book towards the end of his life. He constantly stood up believing in his mind that this is the right thing and acted on it as well. See, the greatest evils of all time were done with good intentions, not with bad intentions. Mm-hmm. It's a very profound message that we learn here. Okay? So, that's the next thing. And there's one last thing. There's a few more, okay? There's another thing which is called imagination. The, the Sephora puts out, listen to this. So now comes the next stage. So the l- woman looks at the fruit and she says, Whoa, this fruit is great to eat. And it's brilliant to see. It's great to see. It looks beautiful. What happens by us normally when you see something and then you're attracted to it, right? Isn't it? Shouldn't it be the other way around? She says, Look how great this Fruit is to eat. And how beautiful it is, appeasing it is to my eyes. What should it, wasn't it the wrong way around? 
right? What do you, what happens first? You see and then you desire, right? She desired to eat it and then she saw it. Why? Why? And we have the same message in Shema. We also have the same message in Shema. It says, Does anyone know? Levavchem. Don't just follow your hearts and your eyes. It should be the other way around. Don't follow your eyes and your heart. And what's the answer? Because the heart is your imagination. The heart is what makes you imagine that this thing is so grand. And then the eyes follow it. It's true that sometimes we see things and we're like, whoa, I want it. But really what happens a lot of times is that my heart feels it and then my eyes want it. Does that make sense to you? A lot of times my heart feels something and it says, oh, this thing is going to be the best thing for me in the world. And really, it's not even that big as you imagine it to be. Okay, so the imagination, what I'm trying to say is that we have what we call an imagination inside of us that makes things much greater than what they really are. Okay, you, you know that in life, we, um, we imagine things to be way greater. So let's say if you win the lottery, right? Or if you won $100,000, what would you think at that point? Invest. Amazing. Amazing. Yes. You'll go out. You'll have a drink. Yes. You'll go nuts. Right? After a week, after a week, will you be as excited? No. So what happens is, listen, listen to this. What happens is, whenever good things happen to us, at that point, our imagination kicks in. And we imagine it to be way greater than what it really is. And when bad things happen to us, what happens? <laughs> it's the end of the world. I'm that, that's it. I don't know what to do, right? So it's way worse than what it really is. Does that make sense? When bad things happen to us, we imagine it. And after a few weeks, like, you're like, it wasn't that bad. What was I even worried about? It's all fine. Just calm down. Why was I so nervous, right? So we live in a world where imagination plays a great part on mind and our emotions play a great part in thinking that this thing is good for me or this thing is bad for me. And that's why it puts the heart before the eyes. It's true you saw it, but it's the imagination that made you really want it more than the, the, the vision of it. It's the mind that said, oh my goodness, this thing is so great. It's so brilliant. Right? And, and then you went running after. It's true you saw it first, but really it was your heart that woke you up that made you think or imagine that it's much greater than what it really is. And how is that in life? Right? Don't we have situations where we think to ourselves, if I, oh my gosh, when I eat this cake, it's going to be so, whoa, right? It's going to help me. It's going to save me. And then you eat it and you're like, really? For that? Right? What was all that imagination about? For weeks you were imagining how great this relationship is going to be. Right? So imagination can actually cause us to push us in a certain way called the way of the evil inclination. Okay? Much more than the vision. Yes? Isn't it one of the morning prayers that it says, like, not to lust after kind of thing? Basically saying not to just follow your heart, but instead of open your heart to the Torah. And if you open your heart to the Torah instead, then you'll have, like, a bounty and prosperity. But if you just follow after your heart's desires, and chase after, like, lust and sin then you'll be smashed down and there will be no fruit for your land. Yes, that's a Shema. Shema clearly says that you can't just follow uh, your hearts and your feelings. You have to control them in order for things to work. Okay? But so again, and it's also about that imagination. There as well you see this idea where the mind is making things much greater than what they are in reality. Yes? But it's also kind of, it basically seems like it's saying if you follow the Torah and like listen to the command should be very successful right and like rich and if not then you're just going to kind of float through life right yes success. yes yes now there's questions on that because there's many people that are not following the Torah and they become very successful and, and there's many people and vice versa uh -huh. there's many people that are not successful and they don't uh, they uh, don't keep the Torah and they're very successful people who are not very successful financially but and they keep the Torah. Yes. But the Jewish people together or is it at the individual level? So it's on both levels. You'll see cases where as a, Right. The Jewish people as a people is confirmed that if we as that's true. 
we spoke about that. So as a people, for the Jewish people as a whole, it's confirmed that we will get all the good uh, if we do everything as a people as a whole. That is a fact, and we've seen that throughout history. But, but as an individual, we can also see it. It's a good point, important to mention. But as an individual, we also see it. How do we see it as an individual? Well, first of all, there's some people that are happier with very little. Right? You can't measure happiness by how much people have. There's people that have a lot, but they're very unhappy. There's people that have a little that are very satisfied. So that's another way of explaining how it works out in this world. And there's more. There's also uh, sometimes the evil people get their reward in this world, which is only a minimal amount of war- award. Right? All their good gets awarded because that's what they like. That's what they want. They just want wealth. And that's all they care about. So that you'll get it here in this world. But the righteous, they get all of their awards in the world to come. Okay? So that's written a number of times in the Torah as well. And uh, we see that concept. Yes? Wait, but there are way- you can still be rich in this world and still get rewards. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Like of course. You're not going to be a bad person if you become rich. No, no. Okay. There's also something else. It says, Bane chaye um zone. The Talmud in Yuma says in the end, Children, whether you're going to have children, whether you're going to have money, or uh, uh, whether you're going to have uh, and how long you're going to live, that is not dependent necessarily on how many merits you have in your life, how good you are. It's dependent on your mazal, on what month you were born in, and what energy you were born in, what family you fell into, right? It's dependent on your mazal, the energy that you're meant to have in this world, not in the merits that you have in this world, okay? Mm-hmm. Even though that Talmud has a lot of dispute because we know that if you, you even though you have a certain, me- a certain position in this world that you're meant to be in, you were made to be in this world with a limit to how much money you're going to make, right? Even if so, <clears throat> with prayer and with... Uh, with specific ways of praying, a person could take himself out of his mazal, pre, uh, predicted state that he was meant to be in, which is an amazing thing. Okay, so there's one last thing. What did she do before she finished? So she eats from the tree, okay? She thinks it's amazing, she eats from the tree, and then what happens? They realize they were naked, but what was the last thing she did? She gave it to her husband as well. What does Rashi say? What does the commentary say? Why did she bring him down? That's what people do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> she gave it to his wife. She gave it to her husband, sorry. She didn't want that she should die. He should live and he'll marry someone else. Who could have that someone else been? Mm-hmm. I'll leave that question to you. But that's what Rashi commentary says. He didn't want that she would die. He would live and continue to be successful. What is the reaction of somebody who does something wrong? They want to get somebody else to do it wrong. They want somebody else. It feels much better when there's a whole team. Let's join a group on Facebook and bring that person down as a group. Right? Not only am I talking about it, that person's talking about it too. Shem's talking about it too. He's talking about it. It's not that bad that I'm talking about it because everybody else is doing it too. It's not that bad that I'm eating cakes all day because everybody else eats cake too. Okay? And what's the aim of a Jew? Is to be a Yehudi ha'ivri. What does a ivri mean? To be on the other side. I don't care whatever anybody else is doing. If this is the right thing to do, I'm going to be alone doing the right thing. I don't care. Right? The Jews have always been a people that are called the Jews on the other side. Why are we on the other side? Because we, don't, we would rather be alone than stick to the flow of what everybody else is doing. You know the famous statement, the sta- saying, how do you know if a fish is for sure alive in the water? You kill it. Against the current. It goes against, against, against the current. The current. Um, right? If it goes against the current, that's when, if everyone's going with the current, who says you're alive? Don't come you out. could be dead. Right? And going with the current. But if you're going against the current, then you're alive. So that's the way a... Jew is. Sometimes we have to go against the current when it's wrong. We have to say, wait a second, I don't care and I'm going to do this on my own. What did she do? She said, oh, I failed. I want to bring down 
Adam with me, and she did. Adam ate from the tree as well and was brought down as well. That is a part of our evil inclination as well. What do we do? We not only, whenever we do something wrong, we aim to bring other people with us in that direction so it doesn't feel that bad. And what's that called? To sin and cause others to sin as well. And that's something which, by the way, is much harder to do Teshuvah with. It says that there's certain things that it's very difficult to do Teshuvah. One of them is if you sin and you cause others to sin as well. That's one of the things that it's very difficult to do Teshuvah with. It's like uh, saying, I'll sin now and I'll do Teshuvah later. I'll come back to Judaism in a hundred years from now when I get old, when I'm walking with a stick. Right? Then I'll get into it. No. If you do that, the same, the same thing happens here as well. If somebody says, I will sin, and I'm going to bring down everybody else with me, it's going to be very difficult for you to get out from it. Okay, so that was really the greatest mistake. By the way, we say in Tehillim, in, in prayer every day, Don't, please, remove my evil inclination before me and behind me. Okay, what do you think that means? Before me and behind me? Old habits and habits that may form. Sorry? Old habits and habits that may form. Okay. Old habits from the past that I used to always have and the habits that I'm going to have in the future. Save me from all my bad habits and what I want to do in the future, which is bad. Okay? That's one way of saying it. What? Anyone else? What does it mean? Save me from doing bad before me and after me. What do you think that means? Maybe uh, the effect of your actions cause other people to do bad and it's like protect prevent that right so prevent after me meaning the people after me right the people the others that come with me is that what you mean uh, be, before you too like uh, oh people if, if before cause, me if you cause people to sin in the past then uh, that teshuva is like very hard it's like hundreds of people can't like you can't do it for everyone but right. it's like help fix that mess help heal right that. help oh so help what I did, which I can't even fix because I caused yeah. others to fix. Nice. Well, what we were talking about today, like every action you have is kind of like putting a child out into the world. So it's, you're putting out these actions and then they're going to grow on for future generations. Yeah. So you're setting the example of future, for future generations to carry on those things that you're doing. Yeah, so they, these things are going to carry on and they're going to have repercussions after as well. But I want to tell you something else that we're talking about right now. Do you know what it is? Before I do the sin and after I do the sin. Before I do what's wrong and after I do what's wrong. Before I do what's wrong, save me. I don't want to do what's wrong. And also afterwards, save me. Do you know why? Because you're still going to sin. Because after I've done what's wrong, I start getting down. I feel worthless. I'll continue to do it. I want to bring other people involved. I don't want other people to do it as well. You know, I want other people to do it as well. I want the whole world to be like me. Right? So that's why we need to pray, not just before I do what's wrong, but afterwards. That even after I do what's wrong, I should overcome it. I should overcome not making others fall with me. And so on and so forth. Anyway, thank you for listening. I hope uh, it had some benefits to learning about the Yetzahara, the evil inclination. That's, what is evil inside of us? Does anyone know? Did you get the idea? What's evil? The eye. The little voice. The what little voice? The temptation. The impulse of our heart. The impulse of our heart against our intellect. Our intellect says, this is bad for me. Why are you doing this? And our emotion says, I don't care. I want it now anyway. Whenever you're going through that feeling, right? You've got to know that your Yetzirah is kicking in. Your mind is saying, don't do it. If your mind never tells you anything, and it never, well, if you may not that, but if your mind never tells you don't do it and your mind says it's completely okay, so that's not your level, that's not your place to work on. That's not your challenge. That's not where your Yetzirah is. Your place to work on is when your mind says this is not good for me and your heart says I really want it. That's exactly what you need to work on. Whenever that's happening, know that that's the evil inclination inside of it. Okay, it's mixed up. And it's saying, hey, do it. And your mind's saying, don't do it. Do it. Don't do it. Okay? And what are we meant to do? Okay. So let me just go over quickly. Well, number one is you test the waters. You're like, hey, let's just 
C, let's just talk about it in general. Hey, you remember that guy, Mickey? Right? You just talk about him. And then the next thing is, you focus on the negative as opposed to the positive of that person. Every time the evil inclination comes in, it focuses on the bad things, on the things you can't do. What about all the good things you can do? Right? That's the second thing. The next thing is, it makes it seem much harder. Not only can you not see it, you can't eat it, but you also can't touch it. Then comes the next thing. And if you did eat it, a lightning bolt won't hit you. Right? It's not that bad. It's true it's not that bad. But at the end of the day, in the long term, it really is that bad. Okay? So, uh, imagination. Then you come with this thing, this mind, the heart is saying, oh my goodness, you imagine it to be so much better than it really is. Okay? That's the next stage. And then comes the idea that it's actually good for you. You'll be like God if you do it. This is good for you. Right? This is a good intention. This is better for you to do it. Weed is good. Smoke. Right? That's when the, they come along and they tell you how great it is for your health. And then the next thing is... Yeah, it's great for you. And then the next thing is you bring others with you. You say, okay, I'm not just doing this alone. I want everybody else to be doing this with me. As well. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Uh, I, I...